G'day mate, 40 here. Let's do a nice little bit of uh, decoding Alexander so technique. So I'm going to be just looking at how ASMR. you're sitting and standing, doing some small corrections, and small measurements, and hopefully getting you all aligned and getting posture perfectly stacked. Your hips on top of your, your knees, your waist on top of your hips, your chest on top of your waist, and your shoulders on top of your chest, okay? Thank you. And this is called the Alexander Technique. The first thing I'm going to do is just take a look and assess your current posture. Could you stand up naturally for me as you would? Okay, so I don't want you to think there's any funny business going on here. This is called ASMR Relaxing Posture adjust, Adjusting Alexander Technique Role Play, but this is like totally kosher, guys. This is like therapeutic and, and healthy. All right, this is. This is the good kind of role play. Okay, and just relax as much as you would. A little bit of overarching in the back here. Neck slightly forward, so we'll work on that. Hips slightly turned. All right, go ahead and have a seat. Okay, so some very, very nice, very healthy Alexander Technique role play. Because I was just reading the New York Times Sunday Magazine headline. How a 14-minute video on posture changed my life. Hint, it wasn't because it fixed the way I stood or sat. It has nothing to do with posture at all. Boy, this is intriguing. So according to the author, the crown jewel of unintentional ASMR is a 14-minute video that was uploaded seven years ago to a channel that has no other content. In Alexander Technique Lesson with Diana Devitt Dawson, woman teaches a law student how to sit and stand up from a chair without causing excess strain on the body. So David Dawson, the instructor, makes microscopic adjustments to a pupil's posture and movement, all the while issuing an enigmatic catchphrase, allow the neck to be free. Presumably filmed as an educational video on the Alexander Technique, a method of posture and movement coaching, the video has all the soporific features of a winning ASMR video. Even the video's color palette is subdued with a theme of gray and muddy purple. Boring as it sounds, this video has become a cult object. It now has 5.6 million views, more than 4,300 comments, with new ones added on a weekly and sometimes daily basis. Fans, some of whom claim to watch the video nightly, have called it the Citizen Kane of ASMR videos and possibly the greatest 14 minutes in ASMR history. The video is memorizing in large part because it's an utter mystery. What does it mean to allow the neck to be free? Is that phrase the rosebud of the ASMR world. Precisely what modifications is David Dawson making to a student's posture? So one commenter notes, watching this literally 1,000 times and I still have no idea how to do the Alexander Technique. Who is David Dawson? The YouTube star with a single video on her channel. So let's have a look at this mystery video. We're going to play it in normal speed. Hello Gita, I'm Diana. would like to uh introduce some Alexander principles to you. So would you show me how you would just sit down and stand? So when I interviewed Alexander Technique teachers, I'd asked them if they were intimidated about teaching the technique or what were the biggest challenges. And I think one of the best answers I got was we're just here to teach certain principles of, of movement and how to be at ease with yourself. So I, I like that. So one principle that I often use is expanding the field of awareness. So right now I'm seeing both sides of the room simultaneously in my vision as well as everything in front of me helps create soft eyes and when I expand my field of awareness I go up, I let go of unnecessary muscular tension, I kind of rise up, I get a lot more upward movement going throughout my body and I move much more into the present moment. All right, when you're seeing both sides of the room simultaneously and everything in front of you, you're not stuck in the past nor projecting into the future, you're not daydreaming, you're very much in the present, but you're in a state of awareness, much more than a state of judgment. So it has a softening effect. And up. Just in your way, all right, and then standing up. Mm -hmm. And are you at the computer quite a lot? Yes, mm -hmm. over eight hours a day. Eight hours a day, okay. And you're studying law. Okay, then, so you, and it's full on for you. Right. Not much reflection on perhaps how you're sitting at the computer, just getting in and doing it, perhaps, and getting what you have to do done. That's correct. All right. So when you sit down, you'll notice that your world steadily starts to shrink. 
uh, particularly after about 10 minutes of sitting, your world becomes a lot more narrow and you will start to put all sorts of strain on your body. Um, just stand in front of the chair again. Where the Alexander uh, re-education or pointers or the Alexander technique as a lesson is referred to, it can help you pay attention to you during the act of whatever it is you're doing. Um, so this is the first time in my life that I started becoming a good friend to myself. Right? I was about halfway through Alexander Technique teaching, training, about 18 months in. And I remember one Friday after school, I said, I'm going to go home and be gentle with myself this weekend. I'd never spoken that way before. But as I let go of all my unnecessary muscular holding patterns, let go of kind of the, the punitive way that I would tighten and pull myself down and in, I became a lot more gentle with myself. And then that opened me up to going to 12-step programs. Um, sitting at a computer, going for a swim, riding your bike, you are conscious of a particular area that brings into balance the whole organism. And it really is... So one thing that's jumping out right now to me is this indent here in the bottom of her spine. So notice how she's kind of tipping backwards from the hips and then the head is kind of jutting forward to compensate. The head-neck-back relationship, so that sort of simplifies it if you like. And the little guiding orders are let the neck be free to, of unnecessary tension. That's un so what does it mean to let the neck be free? That means that your, your teacher or somebody you trust can move your neck with the least possible effort. So right now, right, you can just move my head up and down, side to side, my neck is free. It's the opposite of clenched, it's the opposite of being stiff-necked, but you're very free and flexible with what's going on in your head, neck, back relationship. Right, back to this New York Times article. So this video embodies the curious nature of ASMR itself. So what is ASMR? What exactly does it mean? It stands for Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response. So it's a term to describe a tingling static-like or goosebumps sensation in response to specific triggering audio-visual stimuli. So the first intentional ASMR videos responded to clips and comments on YouTube about a weird, nameless sensation that feels fitting that despite ASMR's present-day popularity, some puzzles within the genre persist. A video such as David Dawson's feels like an encouragement to marinate in the unknown for a while to recognize the many questions it prompts as intriguing but irrelevant. First time I watched Devitt Dawson's lesson, I felt so I'd been transported into an office phone booth, only it was the best phone booth ever. Serene, silent, with no looming editors or pesky colleagues waking, waiting to make a call. This is the paradoxical beauty of it, capturing the absurdly soothing quality of certain real-world situations. Unintentional ASMR can create the kind of peaceful environment that's so difficult to achieve in life. That is, until it's time to exit your happy void and return once more to reality. This is by Eliza Brooks. Brooke, a freelance journalist who writes about culture and entertainment and design. She lives in Washington, D.C., and her article is in the New York Times Sunday magazine. Understood. To let the head balance up on the neck. So if the head is tipping forward, all right, that's going to create a lot of you know, additional strain on your, your spine. Recently got a copy of the English Koran Tanakh, it's an English translation of the Hebrew Bible, and when, when it's balanced, all right, there's, there's no great weight. But when I start to hold it like this, right, then there's much more weight as opposed to when it's just perfectly balanced. So, so too with the head, it'll weigh between 10, 15, 18 pounds. So if it's tipping forward or tipping back, it's going to distort your whole musculature and increase muscular strain and tension. Nick. The neck's not leaning forward so that the spine can lengthen. So my Alexander Technique uh, training lasted three years, 36 weeks a year, three hours a day in school. So that's the typical Alexander Technique teacher training. And I was in it from January 2009 until December 2011. During the act of whatever you are doing, and the shoulders can soften and widen out, softening, widening out. So unlike almost other, every other technique of which I'm aware, the Alexander technique is not piling on 
new techniques on top of old techniques, but rather as a technique of subtraction. So these directions to say, allow your shoulders to release to the sides, to widen, what you're really instructing yourself to do is to let go of any tightening or contraction in your shoulders. And when you're encouraging a person to let their neck be free for the head to release forward and up to lead the whole body, the, the whole back into length, right? What you're really doing is saying stop and let go of any muscular hoarding, tension, contraction patterns that are locking your back down. So instead of piling on new techniques on top of old techniques, we're trying to let go of those responses to stimuli that we've developed that get in the way of our best functioning. Across the whole torso widens. So as, as the student here learns to stop compressing in her lower spine and tightening with her breath and around her ribs, like with every breath, she's probably developed a tightening habit, right? Then this compression in her lower back and the tension in her ribs will start to diminish and soften is one way to talk about letting go of this unnecessary tension. Now I'd like you to just sit down again as you did. And then if you So when I first took my Alexander lessons I had to like kind of push myself up with my hands and I'd kind of throw myself forward and then I put my hands down on the chair to sit down because I was that out of balance out of whack. You stand up again. So in light of what I just was talking about then, the head-neck-back relationship was very much jeopardized. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, our head... So Alexander Technique teachers talk about this area of primary control, the head-neck-back relationship. And so we usually begin by drawing the atten pupil's attention to any unnecessary holding or tension patterns in the neck because there are more joints in the neck than anywhere else in the body. A joint means one bone connecting with another bone. So if there's any unnecessary tightening or compression in the neck, then tightening and compression is going to ripple throughout the whole body. So you start to free the neck, you then release the head to go forward and up, leading the whole torso into length. It weighs about 4.5 kilos. That's a lot. <laughs> Sitting on a little neck. And we would rather it not go back and down when you sit down, because it just puts the spiral. So that's what happens when people get into the habit of tightening and compressing. It usually begins with tightening and compressing in the neck. So the head tips back and down and you get into some version of the fight or flight. So if there's a loud noise that went off behind me, my head would rotate back. All right, my head would rotate back, compressing my neck and my spine. My chin would jut up, jut out and up. My shoulders would rise up and I'd kind of go into fight or flight. And some people walk around in some modified version of this all the time and the compression, I should say, rather than the spiral, all the way down your back. It also, for women, interferes with our pelvic balance and to not least of all, the feet. So almost everybody has anterior pelvic tilt, all right? So usually your right hip, your right pelvis will tilt forward because if you're right-handed or you're driving, all right, you're using your right foot probably more than your left foot, and so that encourages more, more tension on the right side of your pelvis. And because the central nervous system is programmed to try to keep your eyes level at all times, when you, you get developed right anterior pelvic tilt, your back has to wrench to keep your eyes level as your, your pelvis starts tilting forward. And so eventually your back will, quote unquote, go out and you may be immobilized for, for a day or two our feet are, go are not going to be grounded if the head is kept th throwing back and disturbing <clears throat> the pelvic. Aponia says, when that woman disappeared after an Alexander Technique lesson with 40, it was a coincidence, just bad luck. It wasn't bad luck or a coincidence. She just graduated to a higher spiritual plane, bro. She, she crossed the bridge to total freedom. Balance. Now, I'm going to guide you into the chair this way with those principles so you can think about them during the act of actually. So you take a few Alexander Technique lessons and you might realize, you know, I'm not really a guy. I'm really a, a woman inside. Or you might realize I don't want to play tackle football anymore. Or you might realize I want to stop, you know, posting nasty memes online. Or I'm no longer, you know, a political activist. I want to live in harmony with everyone. Or you might 
you know, open up to 12 step program or to therapy or to a life of light and love. You just never know what happens when you let go of unnecessary muscular tension. Most people become easier to deal with, but some people, they kind of let go of their fear and then they become who they really are, which can be, you know, occasionally quite challenging and prickly. Using them, if you like. So you'll be doing the thinking and I'll be doing the moving of you just to, in a uh, general act of sitting down. We do it all day long, sitting down, standing up. We don't pay attention to this. Now stand with a little, your feet a little bit wider ab apart just to give you some grounding about hip width, a little bit wider, not much, that's fine. So now we think I'm going to sit down. All you have to say to yourself is, wait a minute, not my old habit. Allow the neck to be free, the head to balance up, which it is. So most people, when they think, right, they start tightening the neck and the face and the whole body. When most people are about to speak, you'll see a tightening kind of rippling through their face and, and the whole body. When people breathe, often with every breath, they tighten and compress. Now, some tightening is inevitable when you think and when you speak. You just want to have the least necessary amount of compression. And Alexander clarified that a little. He said, allow the neck to be free, the head to balance forward and up during movement, and you just bend your knees quite quickly. And then we wait for a moment. So notice a lot of compression and tightness here, the head tipping forward and back, though the teacher's hands there try to minimize that. So there are other techniques to get to that same place of allowing the neck to be free so the head can release forward and up. And one technique is to expand your field of awareness. Right, so when you see both sides of the room simultaneously and everything in front of you, you've expanded your field of awareness. That will give you some upward direction in your torso. You'll tend to let go of unnecessary tension and compression patterns. Another technique to get to this state is to let go of everything you think you know. So I just allow myself to let go of everything that I think I know, moving into a state of awareness rather than a state of judgment. And it's such a light feeling. I just feel my, my back and my neck unlock and I let go of everything that I think I know. And it's, come, come on over here to this wonderful world of awareness rather than judgment. Now, there are absolutely times for, for judgment, but if you don't need to be in judgment, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing to just be in a state of awareness, have an expanded field of awareness to let go of everything that you think you know. Just hang out here in this happy, present moment of just being in awareness rather than in judgment. And then we just gently come back. Just sitting quiet. So you might be as trad as all get out. Uh, you may be a medieval Catholic or you know, a traditional Orthodox Jew. You might be Mr. Trad. But when you're in, just in a state of awareness, you don't have to negatively react to Pride Month or transsexual parades or Fox News. You can just you can just be here in a state of awareness. Recognize, hey, there may be a lot of monkeypox going on out there. I'm just going to be in a state of awareness right now. I'm going to let go of everything that I think I know. I can let go of judgment. And uh, I can just look outside the window and see a sky of blue, trees of green. It, you can hear children crying, and you can think to yourself, what a beautiful world. Quietly, yep. That's it. So that during that act, we're going to not put compression on this back so that you have, you allow what those last words, those little last guidelines say. Allow neck to be free, the head to balance up, the spine to have its length, the torso. Right, so you want the head, you know, balanced on top of your neck, on top of your torso, because if it's tipping forward or backward, it's going to be distorting, and it's going to make movement more difficult. Like, you're probably wondering, 40, why are you so light in your loafers? Like, why is it that when you walk, you don't really walk, you just glide. Like 40, you know, how come you can just get into the most unbelievable intellectual splits? Like 40, how are you able to run 70 intellectual paradigms at the, the same time? You know, why are you such an intellectual gigolo, falling in love with every beautiful idea that comes along, but ultimately staying loyal to none? Well, bro, I've, I've learned the Alexander technique. I've learned to let go of everything that I think I know, move into state of expanded awareness rather than judgment. Torso to widen, which is certainly what it's doing now. And then you've got a lovely breath. By lovely breath, I mean what Alexander called full capacity breathing, 
where the natural breathing, it's where the lungs are getting air down to the bases of the lungs. It's not just... Right, so most breathing techniques, you are layering on new techniques on top of your old maladaptive techniques. But with Alexander breathing techniques, it's a technique of subtraction by letting go of unnecessary compression. Like, you know, letting go of gasping for air, you know, reducing the need to have holding patterns around your ribs, around your jaw, around your eyes and your mouth and your forehead and your shoulders and your back. By letting go of these unnecessary tension and compression patterns, then you widen, you lengthen as you stop compressing and pulling down, and that creates more space for your lungs to breathe. And then as you become more buoyant, everything just works better. You move more gracefully and easily. Just upper respiratory, panic attack type, nervous situations. We can always come back to the, the inhibition of Alexander lessons, learning to stop the automatic response to a stimulus. And we have- So you learn to stop your automatic responses to stimuli and then notice your habitual responses to stimuli and let them go if they don't serve you. So, for example, walking in L.A., every time you cross the street, you have to really keep an eye on drivers. And I've often fallen into the habit of, like, yelling at drivers who, you know, break the law, would have run me over if I hadn't, you know, jumped out of the way, who don't yield the right of way as they are required by California law. And then I am agitated and upset for 20 minutes, 40 minutes, you know, two hours afterwards. So if I could just get into a state of expanded awareness, recognize that reality will be reality only 100% of the time, that I have no power to control other people and other drivers, have an expanded field of awareness, just notice what's going on with them, and then make my choices accordingly. And so when I get, you know, maladaptive responses to stimuli where I feel like, you know, cursing out a driver or punching one out or throwing, you know, a hunk of concrete through their window, I can just notice that response and I can choose to inhibit it, to not act on that response. I mean, I'm a heterosexual male. I go through the world. There are beautiful women everywhere. No, I don't go around like cupping, you know, beautiful, soft parts of them. That would be <laughs> against the law. That would be maladaptive. So I can inhibit that, that impulse. We have the guidelines. Lovely little guidelines allow neck to be free, the head to balance up, which it is. Your torso is lengthening, softening and widening. All that is taking place. So why should that be disturbed? Simply because you bounce out of a chair. We just do it unconsciously. Up goes the chin, crunch goes the head, and we stand up all day long. So everything you need to learn about the Alexander Technique, you can learn just getting in and out of a chair. Right, there's such sufficient stimuli in folding and unfolding your limbs as you get in and out of a chair that it's just a, a wonderful basis for learning about your responses to stimuli, learning to inhibit those responses that don't serve you, and developing new, more adaptive responses of lengthening and widening by letting go of unnecessary compression, compression and tension. Terrible, terrible compression unconsciously. With this work, you're not doing that, so this becomes so strong and very flexible, and you become free of a lot of harmful habits. For me to help you, or to, to help you get that experience, we'll, we'll just stand up to allow, now to, before we stand up, it's an idea to bring the feet underneath you. To so I've worked with a lot of actresses and models, and I just go into an Alexander Technique teaching zone. So I've achieved such a state of holiness and professionalism, right? You know, I'm not even tempted to, to make a move. I don't believe I've ever made a move on, you know, any of my attractive students. I haven't made a move on any of my unattractive students. You just go into a professional mode. You're here to help people learn about their unnecessary tension and compression patterns. Just a little bit more. And then we just wait. Come quiet. So I would, with a first-time student, I let them know where I'm going to be touching them. So they're not going to be any surprise <laughs> groping, all right? And, you know, definitely none of the erogenous zones, none of the, none of the private parts are going to get fondled. But you, you bring your hands to help your pupil become aware of where they're holding unnecessary tension. But I'll say, okay, I'm going to bring my hands to your neck. I'm going to bring my hands to your shoulders. 
I'm going to take your arm out. I'm going to hold your, you know, from your elbow to your hand. All right, I'm going to take your leg out. I'm going to scoop under your, your back or under your hips to help you, you know, notice and release the necessary tension patterns. Quiet, not getting ready to push. Because I don't want the attention to the legs. That's your stand. It's already in the brain mechanisms that you're about to stand. We don't have to do any more than that. It's, it's there. <clears throat> what we do have to do is prevent the head, the habit. Allow neck to be free, head to bow into foot. Beautiful. And then I know, watch the chin. Uh, so notice that this starts tensing up right here. These muscles, these, these muscles here are about the most powerful in the body. The neck, back, shoulder muscles right here. And so she's starting to tense and compress here. The head starting to tip back. And the teacher's hands are here to try to inhibit that unnecessary tension and compression in the neck. That's going to work. A little bit of arms coming forward, but that's all right. We gently let the head float up again. Yes, 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 yes. And up you go. Lovely. Strengthening, letting the back lengthen. Torso to soften and widen. And widen. Beautiful. Just quiet. Yes. Nice. See, that's, you're not trying to breathe there. It's just happening. So as you start to get out of your own way, as you start to let go of these unnecessary tension and compression and holding and pulling down and tightening patterns, right? then you start to open up. The breathing comes easier. Movement comes easier. Your thinking calms down. Your emotions calm down. Everything works better, works more gracefully and effectively. Actually, and quite deeply. That's very nice. To sit down. It's not about sitting and standing, really. It's about looking after this. The neck is free, head down. Right, when you simply move into the present moment by expanding your field of awareness, by letting go of everything that you think you know, right, you naturally start to move up, start to lengthen and widen, let go of unnecessary tension. Up, let me move you. You're going to send the knees just that way. Free neck, head balancing up. What, 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 two seconds, that was sort of going down. I want you to think. So typically people start compressing, right? When people even look at a chair they're about to sit in, when they're still several feet away, they start tensing and compressing and pulling themselves down and in just from the stimulus of sitting in a chair. And so we're studying the Alexander technique. We start to notice these stimuli responses we have that don't serve us. And so we can still be thinking up, thinking about lengthening and widening, releasing unnecessary tension, even when we are going down in space. So I'm going to be thinking, I'm going to use my left hand so people don't misinterpret this. I'm thinking here, my hand is interpreting how I want my head directing forward and up. So even when I'm coming down, all right, I, I still have that, that gentle desire for my head to release forward and up, even when I'm looking over to pick something off the floor. Everywhere I go, right, the head releasing forward and up. I think like a, a kite, your head's... Follow my the direct, little guiding direction in my hands. So I want you to, like a kite, to think up and you're... So when I, I put my hands on students, it's like uh, jumper cables, all right? I am connecting my central nervous system to theirs. I, I'm usually in, in a calmer place than, than my students, so their anxiety starts to reduce as I transmit what's going on with me to them. Oh. Your spine is going to be the, the tail of the kite floating up and not sticking. The, the bottom doesn't have to stick out. It's the knees that float as they just bend. But neck free, head forward, and then you just bend your knees quite quickly. That's it. And then to stand, we go no, quiet, neck free, stay back in your back, and up to go up. And then we wait. Soft legs, even if we just flash on all the areas, allowing neck to be free, head to balance up, letting the torso lengthen, soften, and widen, and widen. That's it, and wide. So you, so you bring your, your hands to the top of your student's chest, to their neck, to their back, to the, their shoulders, if you're 
have, have a long-term student so they feel comfortable where you can even bring your hand to their face, their jaw, and simply help them notice unnecessary tension patterns and transmit you know, a calming touch. You can allow your neck to be free. During the movement, I want you to come into that hinge. That's lovely, and bend the knees quite quickly. Well done, that was easier, wasn't mm. it? Yes, lovely. Relax. And then you stop. Okay, so a lot less tension and compression there. She was you know, coming in and out of the chair much more gracefully. So it's not about, I'm not interested in the movement per se. I'm interested in where your thinking is. Right, so it's more about orientation. You have an upward orientation flowing through your musculature. you freeing your neck so your head can release forward and up even when you're moving up and down in space. Letting the neck be free. I know the movement will be very much in balance if the thinking is there that links that. So I've had two multi-billionaire clients. I've had uh, full-time models and actors as, as clients, people with regular TV shows. You meet very interesting people when you teach the Alexander Technique. That links that. It's just lovely. Go to get up. No, not my old way. La yes. Beautiful. It's, it, it gives a flow mm. to the whole being. Up you go. And it's effortless. You really didn't need much there at all. And to think I've not seen you before in all of this new experience is <laughs> very good. It's cool. quiet. Because it's, it's going into the... So, yeah, I'll often like cup, cup the student's shoulders just to help that, that area calm down. I remember the first breakthrough moment for me in my first Alexander Technique session was when I was lying on a table and my teacher just uh, released my shoulders, just brought her hands under my shoulder blades and did, did this you know, gentle release of the shoulders and then all that unnecessary tension just flowed away and I felt amazing, so light. The unknown when we come along for an Alexander lesson, you know, we're going away from our habit and all of a sudden we're focusing on to this instrument. It's very important. So when you're cycling, when you're cooking, which is what you also enjoy, I believe, very important that you um, be very creative in, in how you're using your head, neck and your back. And hopefully, Alexander... So when you're teaching, right, you're spending most of your attention on yourself, on your own use. Am I allowing my neck to be free? Am I directing my head forward and up? Am I releasing any unnecessary tension patterns I have? Am I expanding my field of awareness? Right, so what's most important is that you are embodying the good use of the self and that you're at ease and calm and graceful in your own movements and then you can't help but transmit that to your students. This tiny little introduction will give you the, the mm, sort of the the real conscious awareness that yes, you can stop and say, wait a minute, that preparatory work of looking after you, just into free neck, just free shoulders. When we hold the bicycle wheels, we don't have to clench. Just, just. So even just holding a pen, almost everyone holds a pen with way too much tension. So I work with a student, just pick up a pen very lightly and we use the amount of tension that's absolutely necessary because we tend to use way too much holding and tensing and compressing with everything we do from speaking to thinking to typing to lifting weights. In readiness, just enough. Neck free, shoulders free, arms free, hands just enough. And then when we do... So I inevitably notice that women's posture is much better than men's because women tend to live much more in the real world, men tend to live much more in an abstract world. So women tend to be much more in touch with their bodies. So I, I've read surveys that in most areas, men are better informed than women, but when it comes to health, uh, usually women are better informed. So they tend to be better, more, more in touch with, with their bodies, more in touch with reality. You need to pull weeds out of a garden or what have you. You've got all the strength in the world because you've got a strong back as a result of letting neck be free, your head balance up. It's not a weak back because you're not compressing it when you move. To sit down, we go, wait, no, I'd like to flow up. <laughs> I'm going to go up. 
and just let the knees float. Beautiful. So once you get to know people, you can kind of almost read their thoughts on their face because whenever you have a thought, there are going to be corresponding muscular tension patterns rippling across your face. By learning about these habits, you can let go of unnecessary muscular tension. There will always be muscular tension. We, we couldn't stand up straight without some muscular tension. You'll always have an increase in muscular tension when you're thinking. You just want to let go of the unnecessary tension. Free neck. And even if we were to experiment very interestingly with this atlanto-occipital joint, to look down at computers. So the atlanto-occipital joint is basically just below the, the hole in the ear. So when you look up and down, try turning from here, from, from where the hole in your ear is. So you can, you can look up and down from up here instead of compressing your neck. So you can think about your full length, and then look up. Look down, and you're turning from the atlanto-occipital joint. Partic and that's another thing that you're doing all the time. We can tend to drag the neck forward to look down, as in like that. Whereas you've got this hinge, this atlanto-occipital joint, right between the ears. If you put your index finger just below the earlobe, there's a little hollow in there. If you were to bore right through, not a particularly nice thought, but you'd, you'd meet the top vertebra of the neck. And most people carry way too much tension in their jaws. So a technique for understanding the proper resting position for your lower jaw is just to say the word Boston. Okay, at the end of the word Boston, that's where your lower jaw should be hanging out. Boston. Boston. And the head, there's little condyles that the head floats on that. And that's where you can rock from to look all the way down to your keyboard and to type. And so, yeah, one downside to the Alexander technique is you become more transparent. People are better able to read what's going on with you because you've let go a lot of your body armoring. To look at your mobile phone as well if you just met, let that go. And yeah, so that's very viable to you, a very viable joint, without any compression on your sternum and pulling your arms. So if you've got a private thought that you don't want people to read, you can just repress and sublimate and just uh, let go of the normal muscular tension patterns rippling across your face with that thought. You can inhibit the muscular tension patterns that typically accompany that thought. It's down, you know, so it's allowing this lovely open chest, free neck, and then you can key. When you are at your computer, um, I would like to recommend that either use the back entirely <clears throat> where you're resting up and against it, but if you're not using it entirely, please come away from it more than you are, that you're more to the front of the chair. The reason being... Is so a much better technique is to allow one knee to go down. So when I'm doing a lot of sitting, I just drop one knee towards the floor. And then that gives me a strong impetus to go up through my torso. Still got, you know, you've got, still got plenty of balance on that chair, but it allows you to be there and allows your back to widen more efficiently than when, if you were back further, you'd be leaning in. And it's that leaning in that allows the slump. Whereas here... So I've got a stationary bike that I often ride when I'm watching a TV show or a movie sporting event and when I was in the habit of like leaning over onto my you know, bike handles when I was riding that would that would create compression I guess around my stomach and I'd often throw out my back from doing that so I tend to do much better when I'm I'm sitting relatively straight on my bike. You're quite solid and you've got that solid base which is really important this sacral area and particularly for women with our gynecological organs, this area must be must not be yanked in. Just yank that in for me. Very tight and it's restricting the pelvis. So we, we want to have the pelvis beautifully balanced. What balances the pelvis is not going directly to the pelvis but going to what's on top. And it's the head, neck, back relationship which sits on top of the spine and when there's a lovely flow there 
the pelvis will swing into balance and it'll be beautiful. So Alexander Technique teachers t tend to be pretty insecure. One, there's no legal standing for the Alexander